Hello friends, welcome to another day of q and It's joined by my lovely and helpful wife, Lucy. Hi guys. Lucy will be asking me one of your questions from Instagram. Alright, next question is by Dumblock. Um, hi Leo and Lucy, I had blood work done after starting up an asteroid and so my DHEA went way down to 60. I brought it back up by taking 25 mg DHEA three times a week and also HCG. Is there anything else I should be monitoring? Hate taking it, but it works. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you for the question. Before I address the question, I want to let you guys know about something. And uh, so there's a new feature on my on my channel. Once a week, there will be a blog post. This blog post will be more detailed than the video and will be well cited for people that are interested in learning more. And usually I'm a better writer than I am a speaker. So you will probably find that if you're if you're willing to read, you'll probably find better content on the blog post. Not every week's blog post is going to be very long. Or, or as encyclopedic and detailed as this week's was. Every week I'm going to pick the most interesting question to me of the uh, questions that are asked and I'm gonna write a blog post on it. This week I wrote the blog post on this question. And this week uh, the blog post is extremely encyclopedic. It has almost 300 citations, maybe in excess of 300 citations. Uh, I found this, the question very interesting. As you guys know from my Instagram posts, I talk about uh, DHEA and pregnenolone's effects on the brain. And um, many steroids have neuroactive effects. Uh, we'll get into this a bit in the video, but the point is there's a lot of effects on well-being and cognitive performance that come from finasteride. And finasteride is a useful tool to learn just by studying, even if you don't use finasteride. Reading the blog post will be interesting to you because you'll learn about the neuroactive steroids and the neurosteroids and their effect on uh, you know all kinds of things. I'll get into them in a little bit, but point is, on, uh, below, underneath the video, click the link, go to my blog post. There's three posts. The first one is a bit more technical than the rest, but it is really worth getting through so you appreciate the rest of the information. Uh, it's extremely well cited. It's very specific. I hope you enjoy it. And if you do skip the first article because it's too technical for you, don't skip the whole first article. The second half is uh, not very technical and very useful. So with that said, uh, let's talk about this question. First of all, for those that don't know, finasteride is a drug that came to market uh, originally to treat benign uh, prostatic uh, or uh, yeah prostatic hyperplasia, which is be benign because it's not cancerous. What happens to men is the androgens, which are the male hormones, uh, which are also found to some degree in women, but characteristically male male hormones, which are also what bodybuilders take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those things cause the prostate to grow. They also fuel prostate cancers, but benign prostate hyperplasia means your prostate grows so much that it squeezes on the urethra and you have diff difficulty urinating. I see. This is a horrible condition for someone to have. And this is why I take finasteride. I don't take it for the hair. Uh, my, as you guys can see, my hair, my hair actually went back a little bit since high school, but it was, it was at this level by 21 and it hasn't changed since. And it doesn't change from hormones. I just like to study things, which is why I know about uh, minoxidil and all these different things. And I like things that can change things in the body. But I actually don't have that concern. I more have a concern about the prostate. So since I'm past 30 now, I started taking finasteride. Finasteride has been shown in six months to reduce a prostate volume by about 30%. Uh, now, finasteride has also been used to treat what's called androgenic alopecia. Alopecia is balding. Androgenic means it's from the androgens, which mm -hmm. is how men get hair follicle miniaturization as they age. Why it's used to treat that is because, oh, well, we'll get into that in a second, but it's been shown to reduce... Uh, uh, to, to completely halt balding in men that take it for up to five years at 90% of the men. Wow. So it's extremely effective. If someone takes it before they start balding, it's very unlikely that they're going to bald. What finasteride does is it inhib inhibits the action of an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. There are three isoforms of this enzyme, meaning there are three different forms mm -hmm. of it, and finasteride inhibits strongly the second and third isoform. Okay. There's another drug called dutasteride, which Derek from More Plates, More Dates is a fan of from what I gather. And I hope to talk to him more about this on the podcast. He's one of my favorite channels and one of the most uh, technical and uh, competent YouTubers that I've seen, especially in the fitness arena. I really am excited to talk to him. But anyway, I think he's a fan of Dutasteride. Dutasteride completely inhibits the third and second isomer, just like uh, isotype, sorry, just like uh, finasteride. But it also very strongly inhibits the first. I see. The first is inhibited by finasteride, but not that much. Mm -hmm. Now, why this is interesting is because the first is very found, very much present uh, across the brain regions. The second is not even located in the brain. They, they haven't, they can't even find it there. So we'll get into why later, why, why that's an issue later. The point is, 
Phenasteroid inhibits this enzyme. Now, this enzyme converts not just testosterone eventually into uh, not just testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. Mm -hmm. Dihydrotestosterone is the most androgenic uh, yeah. mo uh, sex hormone, and therefore it has the most potency at the hair, uh, at the scalp, and at the prostate. So by by uh, by um, messing with the five alpha reductase, which is the rate limiting step, uh, you get much less dihydrotestosterone. Testosterone is very, especially when this was developed, it was thought testosterone is very critical for male health and psychological health and stuff like that, and dihydrotestosterone was less important for that. So this inhibited that, the highly androgenic one is gone, mm -hmm. you get less balding, you get less prostate enlargement, stuff like that. And so, but also the 5-alpha reductase enzyme doesn't just convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, it also converts progesterone to dihydroprogesterone, which is DHP. Mm -hmm. And it also co converts uh, another hormone into something called DHDOC. Now, I'll get into the issue of this in a second. But the point is, what was found originally when finasteride was prescribed was that people uh, who took finasteride, uh, most of them, the healthy volunteers, didn't develop c issues with their semen. So they didn't become infertile. Okay. Okay, that's one thing. And second of all, their testosterone wasn't affected that much and they seemed to have okay well-being. Okay. But it, as I said, dramatically affected the balding in the prostates. Now, later on, actually, this really case started to come out in 2010. In 2010, um, Merck, which produces Finas uh, Propecia, uh, added a warning in their packet that comes with it that there are groups of people that have persistent symptomology. What that means is you stop taking finasteride because you're depressed or because you uh, don't have energy or whatever else, and you stay like that for five years later. Oh, wow. Doesn't go away. So they added this warning label, but they added it about um, erectile dysfunction. Then in 2012, the FDA went to Merck and told them, no, no, you have to expand it because it's more than er erectile dysfunction that's persistent. So people are having depression and erectile dysfunction persistently after stopping using it. So this is where it gets For interesting. How long? For uh, up to eight years, that's been, uh, as long as they check. Wow. Yeah, basically. Like, uh, as long as they, the, high, the, 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 very long. So it doesn't seem to recover naturally. So in those people with persistent symptomology. And also those people with persistent symptomology experience dramatic uh, effects on their semen parameters. They become infertile, they become depressed, they become all kinds of things. Now, uh, what's known about the side effects of finasteride? Let's get into them. So one thing is known as it, it does seem to cause metabolic syndrome. It's related to metabolic syndrome in a light way. Dutasteride is more effective with this. Mm -hmm. So specifically, it uh, worsens uh, insulin resistance as judged by, or insulin sensitivity as judged by glucose parameters. It worsens ALT and AST liver enzymes. Um, and, uh, this, and also worsens cholesterol, uh, LDL cholesterol uh, rises, but lightly from finasteride. It's not that much of a concern. The big concern is uh, another one is the sexual performance. So there's two parts. I already mentioned semen parameters. The other part is erectile dysfunction. Many people who take finasteride experience erectile dysfunction. Uh, it's been found in rats that when they when they give them finasteride, they experience apoptosis of the penile tissue. Mm -hmm. So meaning the cell death in the penile tissue. And uh, it is known that in finasteride patients, uh, up to eight years later, the skin on their on their phallus uh, has enhanced androgen receptors. Because the body is trying to reach homeostasis, and even years years after the finasteride, mm -hmm. they still have less androgens, so the androgen receptors upregulate. These are found in the prostate as well as in the uh, sexual organs. Um, so there is some changes physically there, mm -hmm. and they are also found in the in the rats, I believe, to have uh, scar tissue, not scar tissue, but fibrosis in the penile mm -hmm. areas. So. The point is there is some uh, potentially some serious damage going on there due to the lack of androgens. And this is probably also the cause for the liver due to the, having less androgenic activity. The liver, as I mentioned in my video on liver cancer, which if you guys haven't watched it, you really should. Um, I mentioned that uh, low dose androgens actually prevents the atosis of the liver and prevent fatty liver disease. But higher dose androgens cause liver cancer. That's uh, super physiological doses with, with you know, with bodybuilders take. So point is this metabolic syndrome, there's, and this is all in the, in the, uh, in the second section of my, of my article uh, in much more detail. There's metabolic syndrome, there's various things. But what's very interesting is when we get to the mind. So these people develop uh, depression and anxiety very frequently. And there's a reason for this. Downstream to progesterone. So first of all, downstream to testosterone, there are two neurosteroids that have effects in the brain. And you'll find details about how they function in my article. But 
uh, what I want to talk about in this video, because we can't talk about too much, uh, is, well, also just to mention, underneath uh, DHDOC is THDOC, that is a very active neurosteroid, not produced in the brain, but, but gets through the blood-brain barrier very easily and has neuroactive effects. But under progesterone, progesterone, not only progesterone itself, but under progesterone, mm -hmm. there are, there's specifically one molecule that's very interesting. Progesterone goes to uh, the dihydroprogesterone and then eventually into uh, uh, two molecules. One is called allopregnanolone, mm -hmm. which is the very, very powerful uh, mood enhancing, uh, anti convulsant, anti seizure, uh, neuroprotective. I mean, it, the list is unbelievable, and you can find the list in detail on the second half of my article. Uh, I just don't have time to talk about it all now. But it has all those powerful things. And then actually, a derivative of that. Uh, or uh, a derivative of progesterone in the end is isopregnanolone, which is this is allopregnanolone. Isopregnanolone has the opposite effects. Now, interestingly, in studies on finasteride patients uh, using their cerebral spinal fluid, it's been found that isopregnanolone is raised, w which is the one that has the poor effects, yeah. whereas allopregnanolone is undetectable. It's oh. completely gone. It's downstream to 5-alpha uh, five reductase, but 5-alpha reductase, the first type, is in the brain. And since it's in the brain, it, you would think the first type isn't completely inhibited by finasteride. So you would think it's still converting a bit of the progesterone into allopregnanolone. But it's not in those patients at all. They don't, they don't have any allopregnanolone. They also have reduced progesterone uh, across all of the studies the, that, I, that I quoted. I quoted the three most uh, complex and robust studies in the article. You should check it out. So the point is, um, there, there's a, there's a, the point is, finasteride is having... Uh, from the studies, what we can see is that people, logically, we know that finasteride is seriously reducing some of the most potent neurosteroids, which I've listed in the article. There are actually five of them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, it seems to be the symptomology of the patients is that they also have reduced progesterone expression. And progesterone has very potent neuroactive effects as well. So, well, let's talk about these effects for a bit. Progesterone and allopregnanol. Mm -hmm. They are neuroprotective. Mm -hmm. They uh, inhibit neural inflammation. They are neurotrophic. They grow uh, in, in ver a variety of ways. They uh, are, by the way, they're neuroprotective across a variety of ex uh, events, which I describe in the paper, like hypoxic events, brain trauma, all kinds of different things. Um, they also, the, now not progesterone, but allopregnanolone, affects the GABA-A receptor. The, and it, mod it modulates the GABA-A receptor, allosterically, positively. Whereas isopregnanolone modulates it allosterically negatively. But what this means is that the GABA-A receptor is more able to receive communication during the day, which, which is why it creates an anti-seizure effect and uh, has these other kind of calming effects. So when women go through, this will be interesting for you, when women go through their um, luteal phase mm -hmm. of the uh, menstrual cycle, which is just before their period, they have higher allopregnanolone levels and they uh, experience less seizures and they have less anxiety. Whereas uh, when women, for example, uh, when, they, when they are pregnant, they have even higher allopregnanolone because the placenta produces it. Yeah. And then right when they stop their pregnancy, when it ends, when they give birth, the allopregnanolone and progesterone both drop dramatically, causing this postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And currently in the U.S., the only drug uh, FDA approved to treat postpartum depression is IV allopregnanolone, given really? for three days at a time. They put the woman in IV in the hospital and constantly inject her with allopregnanolone. Now, allopregnanolone uh, is very powerful, but the, I'll get to the sort of the end of the article a little bit. It's unfortunately very difficult to deliver it in people because it has a short half-life. It converts very easily to different things. There's a lot of issues with it. However, um, there are synthetic versions that are being worked on. And uh, technically, if somebody was a chem chemist, he could produce it for himself. Or you could get someone in China on Alibaba to produce it for him. Um, but, you know, 5-alpha reductase inhibition through finasteride doesn't completely uh, inhibit progesterone's conversion to allopregnanolone. Although it seems to in patients. And by the way, keep in mind another confounding factor. Depressed people have, higher al uh, have lower allopregnanolone levels anyway. So the, mm -hmm. the faster patients, post-fasteride patients, are depressed. So we can't know, is it, are they, do they have low, higher, lower allopregnanolone levels because of the depression or is it because of the finasteride? Mm -hmm. We don't know. So because of that reason, it's a bit confounding. But what we do know is allopregnanolone alleviates depression. So if you could increase their allopregnanolone levels, they will feel better for a variety of ways and it's also neuroprotective and all that kind of stuff. So there are two ways you can really go about that. You can either directly give allopregnanolone 
or three ways. You could give a synthetic version of it, or you could go give progesterone or or some of the upstream things to progesterone. For example, pregnenolone is upstream to progesterone, so eventually it'll be converted to progesterone. If you give directly progesterone, 5 alpha reductase uh, uh, inhibition through finasteride, not through dutasteride. Dutasteride will completely prevent allopregnanolone from being made. You can't do anything. You could take all the progesterone you want. It's not going to convert. But what's going to happen is if you're on finasteride, the allopregnanolone will convert in the brain because the brain has the type 1 enzyme that's not fully converted by the, oh. not fully inhibited by the finasteride. The body also has the type 1, but the brain will be sort of intact, but it will be reduced because finasteride does affect it, but not fully. It'll be reduced. Then the body will still produce a little bit of the, of the allopregnanolone from the type 1, and that will also cross the blood-brain barrier. So basically, you'll have very reduced, you'd have to take much more progesterone to get much less allopregnanolone. Yeah. But progesterone itself is neuroprotective and mood-enhancing and antidepressive and anti-anxiety. And so there's, there's a reason to think that I would like to take progesterone and I would like to take a, a, a synthetic version of allopregnanolone or, you know, whatever. So there's a lot of ways you can work on this. And that's what my third uh, article is about, is about how you can formulate your own plan to use them. And this is not just about finasteride. All of these things are very functional for people that even don't take finasteride. Like, if you have normal progesterone levels and normal allopregnanolone levels, you would still potentially want to get a performance-enhancing effect from it by mm -hmm. using super physiological amounts. You just don't want to do this every day, because if you do it every day, you'll go through withdrawal. So the reason why you go through withdrawal is because they affect dopamine, Pro progesterone does as well, and allopregnanolone does, and they affect the GABA receptors, they modulate them, so the GABA receptor will have a response to that, and then when you stop using it, your GABA receptor will be unusually inhibited. So you can't use it every day. Uh, I'm talking about allopregnanolone especially, not progesterone. Um, How many times a week? Something like two or three times. Person? That's what I would do. And do you have to space it out every yes, day? Yes, I right? would space okay. it out, because GABA is very quick to, yeah, you, you don't want to mess with GABA too much, I always talk about that. but. Uh, so, so anyway, the point is these, these drugs have, uh, very, these neurosteroids have potent effects. There's many ways you can work around it, trying to get around the finasteride. Finasteride will always, though, limit the conversion to allopregnanolone. Mm -hmm. You can go with synthetics. You can go with selective progesterone receptor modulators, which nobody's ever talked about, I think, uh, because they're not very well studied, to be honest with you. But so you could go with those. You could go with synthetic uh, allopregnanolone. You could go with synthetic progesterone. So, for, for example, there's one synthetic uh, progesterone which has very particular affinity for the progesterone receptor. By the way, synthetic progesterones are called progestins. It has a very particular affinity for the progesterone receptor, but it doesn't affect many other things, and it doesn't progest progesterone-related side effects. So, it's a, it's, the drug is mentioned in my, uh, in my article as well. Um, actually, I'm trying to get a hold of it. It's a, it's a very interesting drug. So, the point is, there's many ways you can manipulate this. And what I wanted to do in the article is to give you guys your own opportunity to look at all the tools, to understand the bi biochemistry of it, and then to make your own decisions and make your own uh, program, your own protocol for enhancing your well-being and cognitive uh, function. And if you're, in case you're taking finasteride, to protect yourself from finasteride a little bit as much as you can. Because finasteride is really effective. I'm balding. I wouldn't be taking this. I don't care about it. Look, honestly, if I was going bald, I wouldn't care that much about it. Because I think balding is a part of being a man. It is, it is, it is horrible that society shames men for going bald. It's not, it's not appropriate. If, if something happened to a woman just because she's a woman, like, do people, do people shame women for going through menopause? No. Nobody would dare because the media would immediately assault them. But it's okay on TV for some character on a TV show to make fun of a guy for being bald. It's okay. It shouldn't be okay. That's like, that's part of being a man. And you can't hate on a whole gender like that. It's not appropriate. So that's the way I think of it. So if I was going bald, I would just go bald. But the problem is I don't want to have to go to the bathroom every five minutes because the prostate is enlarged. Mm -hmm. So I don't want that. That's not, a, that's not fun. And so for that reason, and also it seems likely that finasteride would reduce the incidence of prostate cancer. Although there is a little bit of disagreement about the subject. I haven't talked about it in the paper, but it seems quite likely that it does. Uh, and so it could be... Uh, prophylactically taken to prevent that as well. Mm. So I don't know anything about the dosage of an asteroid, but that's, is it dose, like, depending on the dose you take, you have a stronger or lower effect on how it affects your hormones? Absolutely, sure. absolutely. So there are, in the studies, people take usually one milligram of an asteroid. Mm -hmm. Some people take 1.25 milligrams. 
in real life, some people take one milligram every other day. Some people take half a milligram a day. The, it's a dose-dependent effect on the inhibition mm -hmm. of 5-AR. Now, also, I didn't mention this, but there's another drug. So, finasteride is called prop uh, Propecia when it's in the one milligram form. It's called Proscar when it's in the five milligram form. Mm -hmm. And that's given to people with the prostate enlargement already to be more aggressive. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it, there's a dose, dose dependent uh, response. Maybe you could take less finasteride. Personally, I'm very against the prostate enlargement. So, you know, I'm trying my best with it. It has other side effects. You know, I use my teardrops all the time because my eyes are dry all the time because of finasteride. Finasteride affects some hormones that affect the, the tear production in the eyes. Uh, it has a lot of effects, but a lot of beneficial effects as well. Okay. So, point is guys, w read the articles, this talk is nothing compared to the article, and I wish you a great day, and good luck with Finastra.